afternoon, everyone. I hope you, if I can, sorry to interrupt your conversations. Hope you all enjoyed your lunch. For people who are outside, grab your coffee and whatever else. We're just about to start the afternoon sessions break free. They'll be walking in any moment now. Thanks so much. Welcome back, everyone. I hope you all enjoyed your lunch. We now have a real treat. We're going to talk about the global economy. We haven't done much economics yet at this conference, but we have really fantastic folks here for you. And can I just ask the AV, can we get Dambisa up on screen? Because we have one panelist joining us from London. There she is. Hi, Dambisa. How are you? Can you hear us? How are you? Perfectly. Can you hear me? Barely. We're working on your audio, but we'll get there in a minute. Thank you for being from, with us from London, where it's late. So we're going to speak about the global economic recovery, and we have no one better to do it with than Mike Froman, who's currently the Vice Chairman and President of Strategic Growth for MasterCard, but of course was the U.S. Trade Representative, along with several other senior U.S. government economic jobs. We have Austin Goolsby, who is currently a Professor of Economics at the University of Chicago, but he previously served as the Chairman of the Council of Economic Advisors and a member of the President's Cabinet and a great advisor to President Obama on economic affairs. And we have Doug Holtz Eakin, who is currently the president of the American Action Forum, but in the early 2000s was the chief economist also of the President's Council of Economic Advisors and also the director of the Congressional Budget Office. And finally, we have Dambisa, who I think has audio now from London. Dambisa Moyo is a well known international economist, uh, serves the author of four New York Times best-selling books, including a very recent one on boards, but another one that I have loved, and we actually met at one of your book parties, that's a fantastic addition to this particular panel, and that's called The Edge of Chaos, Why Democracies Are Failing to Deliver Growth. So no one better to talk about that than Dambisa. And to interview all of them and bring it all together, we have Ed Luce, who's the US national editor of the Financial Times. Thank you all so much. Thank you very much, Anya. Um, it's great, great to, to be here to do an in-person conference. When we were doing the prep last week, I said I'll have to remember to put my trousers on because we've done, we've done, I've done so many Zoom panels in the last 18 months. So it's a delight to be in person. That is the last joke I'm going to make, though, because uh, in the middle of the stage, you've got Austin Goolsby, who has won the annual DC Celebrities Comedy Contest. So nobody, nobody, I think, would dare compete with Austin. Um, I'll tell one more little anecdote, though, because, Dambisa, you're sitting there in London. The last time I had a panel on stage and somebody uh, above on the video or there on the video was when I was sitting, uh, sitting next to Jeb Bush um, and uh, on stage, and on the screen was Boris Johnson. And uh, the moment he started talking, that was really the end of the conversation. So um, please treat me more kindly than the Prime Minister of Britain. <laughs> so this is a hugely important, hugely important um, uh, topic, the future of global growth, the recovery, challenges and opportunities. Um, and uh, Anya's introduced the panel, so you know they're qualified to talk about this, but they're going to have, I think, pretty different perspectives. One thing, though, I think we can all agree on is that Pandemic is really the starting point of this conversation. Now, uh, um, a year, 18 months ago, 
people were making pretty melodramatic claims about the pandemic, that it would lead to the end of cities, that working from office would never happen again, that globalization as we know it would probably end. Um, I think it's probably fair to say some of the more dramatic expectations have been belied. Nevertheless, the pandemic has changed things. And so I, I'd like to start off to each of you, beginning with Dan Bisa, um, by asking, are we ever going to return to the pre-pandemic world as it was? Or it, are there permanent scars? Are there permanent shifts in the way the global economy works um, that are going to stick um, with us? Well, first of all, thank you so much for including me on this panel. I'm delighted to participate. And um, I'm desperately unhappy that I'm not able to be with you in person. Um, and, you know, perhaps I'll also be apologizing in a moment, Ed, when I say uh, I actually disagree with your opening statement. Um, you know, even before COVID hit in 2020, the global economy was already in a rather precarious place. Um, we already had concern as economists and as public policymakers about the path of growth. Um, you will recall, I'm sure, that in 2019, Q4, Germany posted a 0% growth rate. The growth rate in the United Kingdom was around 1.2, 1.4% for that year. More generally, emerging economies, large economies such as Brazil, Argentina, South Africa, Russia, but economies that have at least 50 million people, had really struggled um, and it very often failed to reach that sort of magic 3% number, um, uh, which is, you know, you need to grow by 3% per year in order to put a meaningful dent in poverty. Um, put another way, in order to double per capita income in a generation. Um, so it wasn't just a precarious growth picture. We had already, before COVID hit in earnest, started to, um, to downgrade the return forecast were worried about the impotence of public policy, both in terms of monetary policy with negative interest rates, as well as fiscal policy. Um, you know, obviously debts and deficits. And then there were a whole slew of headbed. Again, we were dealing with these before COVID. Things like climate risks, uh, inequality, not just income, but obviously education and healthcare um, and access to opportunity. Um, and then add to that, you know, the real questions around uh, the, uh, the the impact of technology automation and what that would do for a jobless underclass. Um, and so, you know, perhaps I'll just conclude here by saying, um, with this backdrop, where is, I would argue that the pandemic has actually accelerated um, and catalyzed the number of the problems we had. Uh, thought we had more time to deal with. Um, if you look about what the Congressional Budget Office was saying in 2016 around meeting welfare payments, et cetera. Um, and so, you know, do I think we could ever go back to the way we were? Um, I certainly hope that we can go to a period where we had double, uh, double growth, and growth and real impact on poverty, et cetera. But I fear that we might be in a, in a very progressive period the foreseeable future, um, which in short is large government, smaller corporations, and more deglobalization uh, as we face the rise of China. Uh, stop okay. there. Okay, th thank you, Tambi. So, a slightly contrarian view, which is that we were already experiencing uh, longer term growth problems before the pandemic, which has accelerated those. Doug, Chief, Tambisa mentioned the Congressional Budget Office. You, of course, <laughs> used to head the Congressional Budget Office. What's your, what's your perspective on whether permanent scarring or not? So I, I think there are things that will be permanently different. And so if nothing else, you think about large multinationals and supply chain management things, there's now an, a, a different operational risk on the table that you have to take into account when you're thinking about how you um, uh, build your company, how you uh, configure your, your uh, supply chains, things like that. So that's not going to go away. People are going to have to think about that differently. Um, so some things will be different, but I think on the whole, I'm closer to your view that a lot of very dramatic claims are made that are quite unlikely to be true. I mean, we, cities are enormous economic engines. That remains true. Uh, globalization is, is a fact of life, not something that's either here or not. There's no question about that. And 
Um, I'm going to agree to some extent. I think growth was a problem prior to the pandemic, and I think we're going to have to work real hard on growth policies across the globe uh, to get the pace of growth uh, a little bit faster than it was. Austin? When I graduated from getting a PhD, um, it was 1995, my grandfather, who lived in Abilene, Texas, called me and wanted to emphasize, he said, I'm going to tell you this right now, never buy a stock. He said, never buy, never buy stocks. He said, your grandmother and I knew many people. They lost everything in the stock market. They were destroyed. Now, this, I was like, you're talking about the Great Depression? And it's 1995. And, you know, if you had bought a stock, you'd probably be doing okay now, you know, in 1995. But that memory of an economic event can influence behavior. I still feel like a lot of the memory of this event, it was funny because we talked about it at dinner last night. I said, do you think in 40 years this will be as forgotten as the 1918 flu was? Or do you think this is, this is a whole chapter in the history book? I guess I think it's, a lot of it is gonna be forgotten and maybe not, it, maybe it won't even take that long, that it won't be like the depression. And I guess my personal bias is that anything where the pandemic's extreme adds on top of what was an underlying trend, I think will be permanent. So I think there's gonna be a lot more there's been a big rise in, in buying things online. That was a trend before the pandemic, and this made it bigger, and I think that's permanent. I don't think we're going back. But anything where the pandemic went the other way of a longstanding trend, like urbanization, like globalizing of the supply chain, I, don't th I think it's only right now that it's pushing back the other way. I think within a few years, we will rediscover those forces that led to it the first time. In the case of globalization, it's cheaper. There's big economies of scale. And when you go five, six years from now, people are gonna look up and say, why do we have a huge inventory of all this stuff? And why are we making socks in the United States you know, when we can make it for one-tenth as much and just make it when we need it um, somewhere else? And you know that that's the moment when it's kind of forgotten. So I, I don't anticipate that when I'm a when I'm a grandfather and like my grandkids getting a PhD, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna be like, make sure you have band aids. You say that. You now. know, get your band aids. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Sure, you have PPE. <laughs> Mike. Well, look, I think uh, the pandemic, on one hand, unearthed a lot of underlying uh, fragility, fragility and growth, uh, financial and economic insecurity. Uh, problems with the growth. On the other hand, as Austin said, it accelerated trends that were already underway, including uh, digitization. And to, to complement what, what Doug said about big companies, if you look at the small business sector, which tends to be the biggest employer in most economies and account for most of the GDP of most economies, it was particularly adversely hit when the pandemic hit. And you found a third of businesses, small businesses were closed six months afterwards about a fifth, 12 months afterwards, and a small business is three times as likely to stay closed permanently as a larger business. On the other hand, you saw tremendous new business creation. People, labor markets were disrupted, people got sent home, they sort of opened up their laptop and created a website and started a new business, and we've seen dramatic increase, particularly online, of new businesses all over the world, about 35% all over the world. In the US, about 80% year on year in terms of creation of new businesses during COVID. So maybe there are scars, but there might also be scar tissue, which creates sort of new strengths going forward. Okay, so we've started with that sort of general perspective of, of the pandemic, but let me just bring it right back down to here and now. Yesterday, the Fed um, began to end its tapering, one of the most extraordinary um, features of this pandemic was the level of Fed support and other central banks, including the Bank of England, support for the economy, the mass purchases. We now have a $9 trillion balance sheet. Um, and this is the first sign, really, of a turn in the Fed cycle, maybe a normalization of monetary policy. Um, 
At the beginning of the year, and I want to start on this one with, with, with us, Austin and Doug. Uh, at the beginning of the year, Larry Summers made himself pretty unpopular with fellow Democrats when he warned that there's going to be high inflation and possibly worse, possibly stagflation. Um, eight, nine months later, um, we've got 4.4% inflation. The Fed are, are still talking about it being transitory, but they've amended their language to saying expected to be transitory. They've sort of backed off quite a bit. Um, was Larry Summers right? I, I mean, it is, it's a whole, uh, it's kind of a whole other panel, but let me just say, I think that fundamentally, if your view is a kind of a 1970s worldview of overheating driven by aggregate demand, so far the data, the price increases are concentrated in a small segment of things which are correlated with the pandemic. Um, and so it, to, to me, it still doesn't look like the, the initial charge, which was kind of o overheating from, from excess aggregate demand. I don't totally get the argument to the Fed. One of the conventional wisdoms coming out of the experience of the 1970s was that you do not tighten to eliminate inflation that comes from a supply shock because you know, if capacity and output is here and capacity comes down, is it really a success to crush output down to this lower level of capacity? Is that a success or is that a failure? It's kind of the like, let's get ourselves used to disappointment argument that the conventional wisdom was to do everything you can to try to rebuild the supply side rather than tighten. Maybe we've sort of lost that a little bit. It, it feels like there's a clamor for why doesn't the Fed tighten and try to prevent the inflation when to me it really very much looks like a supply shock. Um, and I, I, made, I made Larry upset uh, when, I, when I was in a Aspen event. It was a debate uh, with Larry about this topic. And the conception that this is the 60s or 70s a period where we got the output above potential output by about three or four percent of GDP and held it there for an eight year period. And that is what generated the, the lasting inflation. That's really not what this looks like. If you look at the numbers, we're one percent above potential, let's say for a year or so, which looks like 2017, when the unemployment rate was already four and a half percent and we cut taxes, a couple trillion dollars. The mid 2000s before the, before the um, financial crisis, or, and this is when Larry got upset, this looks the most like the end of the 1990s when we were a little over 1% above potential for two and a half years and Larry was the secretary of the treasury. So did they, I asked, did they say in 1999, Secretary Summers, are you worried about persistent inflation from the fact that the economy's running this hot? I, I guess I just continue to think we've three times gotten the unemployment rate down around 4% without lasting inflation. So why would it lead to lasting inflation? Okay, so essentially Larry's wrong. Um, but I mean, if, if Doug, you agree with Austin on that, if this is no. a temporary, I do not agree with Austin on that. Okay, uh, let me, and that, I'll allow you to disagree with him and add another question into that. If this is a temporary supply disrupt, disruption, or there, there is, that's a large part of this. How do you define temporary? Well, why don't we start with that? I mean, I think, yeah. I think uh, uh, Chairman Powell was fantastic yesterday when he said it's, something's transitory if it's not permanent. So that leaves for long-lasting inflation. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, so I, I think. Larry was right in that we're not going to get um, a year's inflation or 18 months. We're going to get something that is more sustained than that, two, two and a half. I don't know exactly. That's going to depend on the future path of Fed policy more than anything else. What do they choose to do? And, and he was right in that the 1.9 trillion in March was a mistake. It was just a flat policy error. The, the U.S. economy was, was growing real-time indicators. It said somewhere between six and six and a half percent. You didn't need stimulus. The output gap at that point was something that looked like four or $500 billion. This was $1.9 so it was way too big. 
And so that's a mistake. The question is, what will be the consequences? His immediate thought was the consequence is going to be permanent uh, raised inflation, which I didn't think was right at the time. I'll freely admit that. I, if you look back at the CARES Act and, and other things going on in the pandemic, largely those, those efforts were saved. So I thought we were going to generate a lot of asset price inflation as the, that stimulus got pushed into to different savings vehicles. And we did see that. But with the arrival of the vaccines that came out of that and went into, into genuine demand uh, stimulus, and we got the inflation from that. And so he, he, saw that, he saw that more clearly than most people. The supply shocks, I think it's important to emphasize that you know, supply constraints are only relative to demand. Right? If you don't have any demand, you have no supply problems. And so what really went wrong is there was an enormous demand stimulus mm. and there were also the, the supply constraints. So the demand stimulus was a mistake and it's raised inflation. And the difference between now and the 1990s is we're getting increases in unit costs of labor that are quite substantial. So wages are rising faster than productivity. So there's a cost push piece to this that is not about just the pure demand stimulus. And that makes it more likely to be durable because if you get higher inflation expectations, which we've gotten, and you've got excess demand, which we've got, and you've got um, uh, wage price uh, inflation simultaneously, you've got the makings of a more sustained inflation picture. So I think that's what we have. Do you think that the evidence of inflation in a bunch of other countries where they didn't take the fiscal response of the US, does that make you feel like that's a US-centric explanation that's so Not it is a very U.S.-centric explanation. I agree with that. I mean, one of the things, you know, we're going to learn more about inflation dynamics going forward, but we, we couldn't get sustained increases in inflation coming out of the, the Great Recession, right? So no. why, why? You looked at that. It was services uh, prices reacting as they normally did, as the economy uh, tightened, service, uh, services uh, prices rose, but goods prices did not. And that was, we just couldn't figure out how to get goods price inflation. We finally figured out how to do it. Don't let people buy services for a year and a half. You'll get goods price inflation. Now we have that, and we've got the supply chain things. And so I, I, I think it is much so, more U.S. So, I mean, if, if you're right, Doug, that I mean, I think most people are expecting an interest rate turn, but uh, from from your perspective, probably a sharper one than yeah. Austin might recommend. Then Dambisa, we are back into pretty familiar territory in terms of the impact on emerging markets. Um, which is the cost of their dollar do debt goes up as the dollar appreciates, their ability to service it goes down. Are we <coughs> seeing something that I think might be really underappreciated in the West um, as we debate these issues of inflation and wage growth and so forth? Are we seeing um, a permanent pandem pandemic hit to the developing world, the, the reversal of a lot of these millennium development goal gains that we've seen in continents like Africa. Is, is, is this a global divergence we're now beginning to see or is that, is that too bleak? Um, I don't think it's at all. Um, if anything, I'm, you know, I'm quite concerned on a three metrics that um, are perhaps were not really taken as global as the perspective that we really ought to be. Um, so the three areas that they worry a lot that a lot of conversation tends to be, and I should say it's still on the board of a lot of number of large global corporations that are made in the United States, so I understand that this view tends to um, dominate, but very much a view based on tactics and not enough on the sort of structural uh, long-term problem. If you look at the IMF World Bank, uh, World Economic Outlook forecast in their tracker, onwards, the growth stories are um, precarious once again. So that's one area. The other thing that I talk about a lot is that the conversation tends to be way too US focused um, as a time when there are real structural problems in the US. And um, I think that the US, you know, I think it's not a surprise, um, has a lot of uh, uh, sort of recalibrated in terms of its real economic and certain geopolitical life globally, and that has real implications for whether or not we can address some of the problems that we're depending on right now. And then the last thing is that we have these conversations, if price is largely a vacuum, um, really discount the China's role. Um, so, you know, China is the largest trading partner 
foreign direct investor and lender to the emerging market. Um, it's larger now in terms of lending than the IMF, Paris, World Bank, and some people might think that's immaterial. Um, but you know, I do think that it's very hard to discuss the role and the impact of the pandemic when there's this massive um, sort of a structural shift that's occurred, um, and and therefore all the big uh, negative externalities and public goods issues like climate change, etc., that we're dealing with, uh, I, to my mind, will not be solved for just taking a, a lens of, of thinking about the U.S. and whether or not this is real or uh, permanent. So it's just one view, but like, I don't want to sound sort of uh, like a negative many, but I do think that uh, we've got bigger problems, and I, I think uh, there's a real risk that's not a dual lens that we want to use. Uh, thank you, and that's a very important perspective, and I hadn't heard negative Nelly for a long time, so thank you for reminding <laughs> me of that wonderful phrase. Mike, uh, all the discussions about the economic outlook, whether we're talking about the, the US inflation rise or global growth, boils down ultimately and, and immediately to whether we can get the, the world vaccinated. Hmm. Um, and where, where, where Tambisa was born, Zambia and the African continent, we've got rates still below double digits in many countries. Here we're, you know, more than two thirds. But until we get them vaccinated um, and, and control this pandemic globally, how much of our economic outlook is on very, very shaky ground? Well, I, I think you put your finger on it. And, and whether it's in Africa or it goes back to Austin's point about things being temporary with regard to the supply chain or other, other supply side shocks, um, the lack of global vaccine equity in its distribution is having ongoing economic effects. It's hard to see how that supply side piece of that equation sorts itself out till factories reopen. And it's proven to be much easier to close down a factory than it is to reopen one really anywhere, but particularly in these developing, uh, in developing countries. And so it's put a spotlight on just how fragile those supply chains are and how difficult it is to, to substitute for them, at least in, at least in the short run. Um, you know, I, think the, I think the global community has been slow to make sure that the, the vaccines, the treatments, the diagnostics have been distributed in an equitable fashion. There's been a lot of effort, a lot of money put towards it, a lot of production, a lot of innovation in the pharmaceutical sector, but it is still woefully slow in getting to that last mile of distribution in the developing countries. And I think that has, that has ongoing impact. Now, whether it's a six month impact and everything will be back to normal or you know, 18 months, uh, I guess if, if Chairman Powell says anything that's not permanent is temporary, then we're in firm, we're, we're pretty safe saying this is a temporary dislocation, but um, it does make a big difference of whether it's six months or 24 months. So you're in the expected to be transitory camp. Which, I am. Which I think we all are. <laughs> um, but if, you know, the, the, there is a, a bleak outlook for some of the labor force in the United States where we have two thirds vaccination rates, um, then the perspective from the developing world is a lot bleaker. But just to stick to the United States, um, we've got 10 million job openings and people aren't filling them. Now, economists usually have the answers to data problems, but I haven't heard an economist give a good answer as to why. So why would you ask us in public? <laughs> <laughs> and not warn you. Here's your chance. He's a journalist. <laughs> well, he wants to make us look exactly. funny. And I'm allowed not to warn you in advance, I'm going to ask you. Um, uh, this is a conundrum, right? I mean, some people talk about long haul COVID, others that there is still a lot of financial cushion from the stimuluses that enable people to pick and choose, others that people are taking early retirement. Um, women are finding it hard to go back to work because of childcare. But nevertheless, we have millions of jobs that aren't being filled, and we have a labor force participation rate in this country that's the lowest in 50 years. What, what, what's going on here? Is this a permanent hit from the pandemic or is it all gonna slowly or rapidly normalize? So I, I think first you have to have a view on how the pandemic plays out. So here's my view that sort of explains how I think people think about this. It, it doesn't come and disappear. They were told that once last spring, it turned out not to be true and so they expect to see additional waves of, of the virus. That's a sensible expectation. And as we deploy, not just vaccines, but think of, of the, the Merck uh, oral tablet, which is a, a, 
a treatment, if we can diminish the consequences of COVID, it becomes less threatening as well. So testing, vaccine, therapeutics, all that matters. And over time, that will increasingly make these new waves of the virus less important. But it's not going to zero. So they're not going back to what they used to do. And so if you take the, the key to this, it's the, the labor force participation rate of females, which is two and a half percentage points below what it was in February 2020. It's about 2.4 million workers. Um, why are they not coming back? Well, some is just flat fear of the virus. Some is responsibilities for childcare, including not being sure the schools are going to stay open. I think that's a big part of this, right? They, sure, the kids went back, but do you take a full-time job not knowing how that works out? Um, then there are the, the financial benefits, which have now disappeared, and, and the residual stimulus. I, I think by the beginning of next school year, most of that has shaken out, right? We've, we've gotten online additional ways to deal with the virus, and we've, we've removed a lot of the uncertainty about the, the uh, household responsibilities, and, and, and we'll start to see that return. But for the moment, it's just too soon. I mean, if the vaccination, it, Larry, at a it similar stage, which, which I totally agree with, call for essentially a Marshall Plan for vaccinations, mm -hmm. yeah. uh, the rest of the world. If in places where they have very low vaccination rates, some variant it erupts and spreads around the world again that that bypasses the vaccine protection we could be back to square zero so i don't think that i don't think that you're wrong that you know we're not safe until everybody's safe and i think for for me in the u.s the labor mark labor force participation thing is highly tied to fear of the virus or taking care of somebody who got the virus or you yourself got the virus. I think that's the, the main driver. Um, so aside from the pandemic and global vaccination and the uncertainty over whether new variants are going to interrupt all our expectations, the other really big imponderable over the global economy that's more talked about than actual at, at the moment is decoupling from China. And in a moment, I'm going to ask Dambisa to, to respond to this as, as well, because you've written a book about the race for resources um, in the developing world and how China has vacuumed them up. But I want to start first with Mike. Um, you, uh, you negotiated the Trans-Pacific Partnership um, uh, under the Obama administration. Trump then pulled out of it. Guilty as charged, yes. Guil guil guilty or, or whatever your perspective on it, you were in in intimate, intimately involved with that, that negotiation. Um, now we're in a situation where America is over my dead body. It's going to rejoin the TPP, at least with politics as it is now. And China applying to join the CPTPP. Is, is, is this an era of decoupling or just role reversal? <laughs> well, look, I, I, let's separate decoupling maybe from TPP, uh, at least initially. I think in terms of decoupling on trade, there's still a tremendous amount of U.S.-China trade going on. The trade figures are up. It's not up as much as the phase one Trump trade agreement would, um, would have um, demanded, but it is up uh, in both directions. Uh, I think where you're likely to see decoupling there in, in more real terms is around uh, technology standards, um, uh, some of the foreign investment issues in both directions, uh, cooperation on research and things of that sort. And there, I think there's a real uh, race to see who, who, who's in the room and how do the rules of the road get established for these new areas around data, around the digital economy, around artificial intelligence, and and whether it's whether the U.S. will be in the room in some form or another. There's already work being done in the Asia Pacific between Singapore, Australia, New Zealand, Japan, Korea, Chile, to sort of pull together like-minded countries on the digital economy to think through these issues a bit as an alternative to China's vision of what a digital economy looks like. Will the U.S. play in that world or will we sort of cede the ground to, to China, to China joining the, the CPTPP and, and for us being on the outside? I think that sort of remains to, to be seen. Uh, I think we are in desperate need of a, an economic and trade strategy vis-a-vis -vis that region to complement what we're doing on the military and strategic side. And I think our allies and partners in the region 
are eagerly awaiting us to come back to the table in some form or another to work with them on these issues and give them some capacity to balance the magnetic force that China provides. But it's so fair to say it's not an immediate impact on growth, the talk of China-US decoupling, but it's, no, it's, 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 it remains for the time being a huge diplomatic and political issue. I think it, it may not be an immediate impact on growth, but I think you can see competitiveness going in different directions and whether we can be competitive and our innovations and R&D and companies can be competitive in a world where the standards are being written away from us. Um, Dan so you've written a book on this, as I said, and, and you've, from the African perspective, uh, been at the coalface, as it were, of uh, observing China's commodity extraction um, machine, and Zambia in particular, in fact. Um, what's, your, what's the developing world, and the African um, perspective in particular, on what China-US decoupling means? So, I will just start by saying that I think it, it, I'd love to offer a perspective here that's really driven by what's happening um, in particular for uh, asset allocators. And I'll come to a specific point about Africa in a moment, but I think, again, it would be, it would be remiss of me, given that I sit in boardrooms and these conversations are very live, about capital allocation and risk mitigation. How are we thinking about where to? to allocate that marginal dollar, um, this question does arise. And I think whether you're in, in an endowment, um, as I, I serve on the endowment of Oxford University or in the board of corporations, um, I think there's no doubt about that there is a sense that there are fissures that are emerging that are altering the investment um, patterns. And you know, if you think about institutional investors really only having about 2% exposure in China, uh, and really, a lot of the narrative now is, is creating a bigger wedge um, of, of globalization in trade, in capital flows, in immigration, um, global cooperation, as, as uh, uh, Michael just mentioned, as well as sort of these ideas of, of the splinternet. It's definitely moved us into a world where we think more of a pilot world, more of a world um, in which you have to think of very clearly about um, what happens if sort of a, a fault does emerge in a much more um, sort of aggressive way than that. Um, so that, that would be my broad framing of your, your previous question. Um, to the question of you know, what are the developing world are thinking about here, um, a lot of the conversations that I have are really about pragmatism. These economies, going back to the, the growth question, um, have to solve the question of economic growth, but also solve um, a lot of the challenges that we're all familiar with, like climate change. And somebody needs, in their minds, to fill the gap that uh, traditionally, I think the G7, some combination of the G7 and the US um, certainly um, occupied. Um, I hope the US uh, you know, does come back to the table in an aggressive stance, but the demands on capital um, and the demands in terms of really forming a narrative for, and a growth story for the future, even if you don't believe it, um, is something that the emerging market finds very uh, attractive. Um, so that, uh, what is one that coming from China is one that they find very attractive. Of course, the short term is them. Um, you know, we'll give you a, you invest in a mine today. In fact, they're not, no longer even taking ownership. As we know, these are long term. Uh, leasing contracts, etc. But for many emerging markets, um, they have to figure out a way to fund the climate concerns, but also to fund growth and job creation um, at a time when they, they're simply not able to have the sort of stimulus actions that we've seen in the West. So, on the whole, you don't have to really you look at the Pew surveys, people are much more sanguine about China's role. Of course, it's not considered uh, you know, perfect. But there's certainly a, there's a sense by policymakers in the emerging world, specifically in Africa, that this, we're not in a position to, uh, to simply ignore them, uh, especially at this time, given trade, foreign direct investment, and, uh, and uh, lending. Um, well, that's, a, that's a very interesting perspective. You also mentioned Splinternet, which reminds me of what you said at the beginning, Austin, that you are expecting the global supply chains to, returning, to return to pre-pandemic. Um, uh, something about resembling the pre-pandemic pre period. Um, 
but that you also um, think the pandemic accelerated pre-existing trends. Well, a pre-existing trend was US-China um, frictions and growing apart. Um, and the fact that the virus came from China and the, uh, all the sort of political um, falling out that we've seen in the last 18 months seems to have accelerated that US-China divergence, at least on the political level. Might we be seeing that on the global supply chain level as well? I mean, the panel earlier that, that Anya was moderating um, you know, talked about the health resiliency side of things and all the other, all the other um, um, psychological effects of this pandemic on, on how governments stockpile, etc. Might we, if we see a technological divergence with China, a serious one, um, um, be looking at a very different kind of global supply chain a few years from now than, than what we had before the pandemic? I feel like you kind of, the, to, to answer that question, you have to decide if what happened was we went back to a supply chain that looked very much like it did before, but replaced China with Indonesia, with Vietnam, with something, would you view that as a fundamental shift? In my, in my mind, that would, be, that would be a system that looks a lot like what it did before. And in a way, as China's gotten to be a richer country, that already was happening. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the idea of very low cost labor all being from China, as, that was largely a thing in the past as, as they got to be a middle, middle income or above uh, country. I guess my contrarian take a little bit on China, and, and I've said it before, is as China gets richer, every rich country of the world, not in pandemic times, their economies are dominated by service sectors. And China's really is not. And so the natural thing to happen as China gets rich is they're going to spend more and more of their income on education, financial services, healthcare, leisure and entertainment. All of those things, if the rest of the rich world is an indicator, will be predominantly domestic driven demand. And so I feel like not in the immediate term, but over the medium run, there is the potential for some of this direct friction to go away. Because China will, for the most part, China is and will be a predominantly domestically driven economy. The US is and will be predominantly domestically driven. And the, where the friction comes is, has been this export model. Maybe that means the export model friction turns to new countries, but if we could just get it off of the geopolitical with China and the inevitable, are we turning right. into the next Cold War? I feel like that would be a, a change. Well, that's the most positive thing I've heard, I've heard so far. Um, I mean, Doug, I mean, just to play devil's advocate, but to throw it over to Doug, um, you know, the, re the, real, the real action is on the sort of high tech, the semiconductors. Sure. Um, and, that's, and that's where China is trying to indigenize. Um, Taiwan, of course, is, produces 80% of the top level semiconductors. Do, do you share um, Austin's sort of slightly deterministic economic optimism, I guess? I mean, I mean, I mean deterministic. I politely. try not to share anything with Yeah, he you share, you <laughs> don't share. You, don't, you don't share anything. Okay, what don't you share? No, so, so it, Take the the view that China is going to have a you know sort of services driven economy, which I, I think is a sensible way to think about it. There's still a lot of friction there. A lot of U.S. companies position themselves, invested billions of dollars in China to be the provider of those financial services and other things. And China essentially stole their IP, gave their their uh, their markets to domestic competitors, and and generated an enormous amount of friction. So that's not a frictionless forecast, in my view. Um, and you layer on top of that. Um, the sort of, uh, uh, you know, key sectors on, on artificial intelligence and technology advances and semiconductors and, and, you know, and then in the pandemic, we learn about sort of health security and, and having adequate domestic supplies. There's a lot of potential for, for strategic retreat from one another uh, because of the potential for conflict. And I, and I think that's more likely the case. And I, I'm, but I'm going to agree with Austin's sort of paradigm, which is, that just, the, pan, par, the, the pandemic just reinforced something that was going on anyway. We were doing more industrial policy, we were, we were picking our national champions, we were uh, engaging with uh, China in a trade war. 
the pandemic just ex accelerated that. It was going to happen anyway. So, Damisa, we're, we're moving a little bit beyond the sort of immediate prospects for the global economic recovery, but I um, just want to come back to what America should be doing. I mean, you very eloquently laid out um, you know, that China's been, if not the only game in town, the main game in town in many emerging markets. Um, what should the United States be doing to, to ensure it isn't the only game in town? Well, you know, I respond slightly, uh, perhaps a little contradictory, because ultimately I would love to see the United States uh, be a, an important player uh, on the global stage in a lot of the complex issues that are um, the world is grappling with right now. I, I do think they've lost a foot today. Um, the reason it's, it's slightly uh, counterintuitive, I think that a lot of what I would say was need to focus on is, is under the banner of position heal thyself. Um, you know, it, it's not a good look. Uh, you know, I, I obviously live in the US, but travel a lot, and it's not a good look coming out uh, in, being in Europe or in Africa or in Asia, being in the US. Um, growth looks paltry. Uh, yeah, the political fissures are, are pretty. Uh, you know, unappealing, um, infrastructure, desperate needed, but just keep, uh, you know, getting there. And, you know, even if you look at the infrastructure proposals, um, they're, they're, to my mind, a lot more about the future and less about uh, the here and now. So, yes, we support and wrote, et cetera, but I really love to hear a much more of a, a, a more of sort of aggressive approach on, on where, the, where the proverbial public is going, you know, things like AI and technology. I'd like to believe, and I mean this in a public policy space, not in sort of Silicon Valley, but I'd like to believe that those conversations are happening somewhere, but it's, um, you know, quite uncomfortable to watch, um, you know, I think the last, you know, couple of decades, things like the financial crisis and Arab Spring and Afghanistan and the pandemic and the manner in which in not being addressed um, in the U.S. and uh, get any confidence that the U.S. Uh, you know has a response, uh, let alone a good identification system from these issues. So I think that's where I would say we need to focus, get those things right, and that really will attract a lot of people from uh, other nations. Uh, I, I pr presume, though, starting with vaccines, uh, uh, and I'm guessing that people in Africa and Latin America would prefer um, uh, um, uh, Moderna and Pfizer and um, AstraZeneca than they would to Sinopharm and Sinovac and Sputnik V, but th there aren't too many of those yet. Yeah, look, I mean, I, I think when you're at, you know, facing the air, the cold face and the death threat, you'll take what you can get. Unfortunately, despite proclamations and promises, or, you know, on vaccinations on climate, etc. Uh, and I'm not a big believer in aid, as you know, Ed, but uh, I you know we make these proclamations and think they're cost free, and they're not. Um, countries watch and they do take a dim view of America's world in that regard. Mike. You know, I, I think it's uh, kind of remarkable that despite all the investment that China put into Africa, Belt and Road, uh, it is not necessarily translated into the soft power gains that one would. Uh, one would expect, and uh, it, they, they certainly do have, it is a source of leverage over governments for all sorts of, of reasons. But um, I, I gather Arthur Brooks was up here earlier talking about love. It's not a source of love. Um, there isn't a lot of love out there uh, for the Chinese projects in many, of these, uh, in many of these countries. And I think the U.S. will never be able to match dollar for dollar what the Chinese are doing. There's some good steps with the Development Finance Corporation with the Build Back Better program, things of that sort. Uh, but it really is the rest of the world looking to the U.S. to engage and to be willing to do what it takes to show leadership. And they sort of missed it for four years. They're looking for it now. I think uh, the Biden administration has begun doing more and more of that. Uh, but there is a there's a crying need and a crying demand for it in many parts of the world, including on vaccines, but broader than that. So in a moment, I'm going to go to, to audience questions, but just very quickly, and I'll spare uh, Dambisa from this particular question, since we're within view of Capitol Hill. Um, maybe it's that way. Um, if, this, if these Build Back bit, Better bills passed, um, will it um, improve the nature of the post-pandemic recovery we've been discussing? 
um, A and B, do you think they're actually going to pass? Um, I mean, you can deal with these quite quickly in turn. I'll start with Doug. So the infrastructure bill is about half deficit finance, and the CBO work on this says that if you finance it by cutting non-investment spending, you get lasting permanent impacts. If you deficit finance it, you get a short bump and nothing. This is in between. It's about half and half, so it's sort of eh, not going to have a big impact. Directionally positive, not, not dramatic. Um, the Build Back Better will, it depends on, on in the end, what, what can get over the finish line. And I, I, I at least hold the view that they're going to have to get across the finish line some piece of the president's campaign platform. It's just inconceivable that they don't. So they'll get there. It's just going to be ugly. Um, and the, the only concerning trend I have about what's in there, well, I have lots, but the, the one I, I'd, I'd highlight is as they try to get the price tag down, they front load the spending and they have to pay for us all through the 10-year window. It's turning more and more into a stimulus bill, which is the last thing we need at the moment. Awesome. Look, I'm more, more of a fan of the, of the investments. I think they're important areas, the child care, the education, the infrastructure. I don't realistically think that it's going to be that impactful over the next six to 12 months, um, which is in my mind, the kind of the most relevant time frame of the coming out of the pandemic. So I, I largely think it's, it's orthogonal. Um, Matt, a way of rephrasing that question is, could it help change the voters' economic outlook before the midterms? There, I don't think, I mean, like I say, I think this is, the, much of this is baked in the cake, in my, in my view, is a worldwide phenomenon that supply chains, the ports getting backed up and the shipping, it's a global supply chain. You're seeing it all over the place. I don't think it's from U.S. policy. That said, it's not going to make people feel any better. We're still going to have six months of grumpy. Even if you're in on Team Temporary, you, you're thinking about months, not weeks, mm -hmm. certainly not days. So I think the administration is just going to have to live with that grumpiness uh, you know, going into the midterms. It's a fairly underwhelming vote for, for <coughs> the Build Back Better. Do you agree with that? I think it's net positive, and I think net net it'll get done. And I think its implications, maybe they're modest on the economic side, but I also think, you know, having just come back from Rome and Glasgow, the world is looking to see whether we can actually deliver domestically what needs to be done to be able to exercise leadership abroad. And I think it's very helpful in that regard. Um, okay, well, maybe we can get a climate change question um, um, from the audience, but um, we've got about 10, 10 minutes um, for, for questions. Yes, the, the woman in the front here. I have a quick question for each of you on the stage. Um, Doug, last week the uh, GDP annualized was 2% growth, and I think the announcement that was made pointed to both supply and demand side issues. So I just wanted to ask you to comment on that. Um, on the demand side, they pointed to sort of the slowdown in stimulus to American households. How much do you think that is contributing? Austin, my question for you is, um, uh, U.S. households have a glut of savings. There's been a lot that has built up over the course of the pandemic. How much do you think that is contributing to sort of the slowness of workers going back uh, to the office? And then, um, Mike, if I can ask you what, um, it sounds like the uh, sort of the U.S. Um, has been very slow in terms of the global response to vaccines, um, and it seems like a missed opportunity in terms of soft power. Um, is the issue uh, funding? Is the issue last mile, or is the issue supply? What do you think is the biggest problem? Okay, in turn, Matt, that was three questions, thank you. But. So, 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 so real quick, there's a, there's a lot of one-time stuff in there that, that's <laughs> gonna go away. So, you know, autos subtracted two percentage points from GDP growth, that's the, that's the chips and supply things. So I'm not worried about the, the fundamental trajectory of the economy. Um, if you look at the high frequency data, like the most recent payroll uh, employment report, we've got uh, payrolls were growing at an annualized rate of 18%. There's tons of uh, uh, growth potential out there if we can just get people to work. I don't think the savings was that big of a component of labor force participation. From my, I told you my own personal bias is that it's, it's coming from the virus, that if we get control of the virus, if the numbers keep coming down, that 
that I agree with Doug more than Doug agrees with me, but um, <laughs> but I I, th I think it could be come back pretty strongly, and I don't think the I don't think that if you look at whose savings went up, um, it tends to be people who um, had stock market holdings because the stock market's been way up, and that's not the the for the top at least third of the income distribution, there was no recession. They, ne they didn't lose their jobs, incomes didn't go down, stock market wealth went way up over the pandemic. So I don't think that that can explain it. Uh, I don't think it's an issue of money. There's actually been a fair amount of money mobilized and organizational capacity to, to collect it. Uh, I think it's more one manufacturing and getting the inputs and the manufacturing capacity that's reliable to, uh, to produce it. Um, and two, as you, put, as you put your finger on it, the last mile delivery. In a lot of these countries, the healthcare systems and the capacity to get things really distributed across the countries is still uh, pretty rudimentary. Um, I, there was, yep. Um. So I just have the one question for the whole panel. <laughs> I wanna go back to a topic that you raised earlier about the number of entrepreneurs, people who were sitting at home and decided to start a business. I work for a semiconductor company and we can attest that this is this period we've experienced is the greatest adoption of new technology in human history. Mm. Everywhere, we've never had a period where every single region of the world, Africa, Asia, United States and Europe all simultaneously got more connected than they've ever been and we certainly see that as a continuing thread. We also see that people are using that technology to create businesses and be disruptive. I'm wondering if you think that that is sustainable and if that's something government should begin to pay attention to, that this disaggregation, right? People can start a business anywhere, anywhere around the world. D Dan Beza, did you hear that question? I did, yes. Um, you know, my answer, I hope so. I, mean, I don't think anybody would say that that's a bad trend. Um, I do worry if you look at some of the, this is actually, there's a wonderful article today in your paper uh, in Financial Times talking about undereducation and whether or not that will sort of get or uh, sort of cancel up some of the effect um, uh, that we're seeing from the digitization. Of course, there are broader questions I would say here about um, how society benefits from innovation. I think technology had enormous gains um, in consumerism and network, and that's great. But I would, I would love to see more in terms of traditional public goods, education, healthcare, and really see an uplift there. Um, and, and perhaps that's where the real sort of uh, expansion of the pie uh, will be in, in the, the years to come. But certainly right, governments need to focus on making sure that innovation, and I say governments, because those are important in the policy environment, um, to make sure that we do have a more of a mistake. Mike. I would just add, we, we certainly see that, but I think it's also a real concern about whether there's a new digital divide emerging. You still have half the world's population that doesn't have reliable access to the internet, over a billion people who have no foundational identity, over a billion people who have no access to basic financial services to borrow, to grow their businesses, and particularly in developing countries, but right here in rural America and, yep. and, and, and you know, New York City, you've got digital deserts that create the problem that others might be left behind. We, we've got time for one, possibly two, depending on how staccato you are, questions. Um, does anybody want to ask a question? Yes. Uh, just wait for the mic if it's coming. Quick and staccato. Uh, I'm struck by the introduction of the Belt and Road Initiative, uh, Jim Bisa's disacknowledgement of aid and whatnot. So knowing that there is this risk, both domestically and internationally, of folks falling behind digital divide, in your opinion, does the U.S. presently have a vehicle to deliver and compete with China in these places of the developing world? Is it AID? Is it the International Development Finance Corporation? Is it something else? Mike. Uh, so I think we've got lots of tools, uh, and I think the Development Finance Corporation is really stepping up in, in meaningful new ways um, and to be able to, to do some of that. I think ultimately our strength is going to be in the private sector, and so making sure that we're helping to support the enabling environment where the private sector feels comfortable going in and providing those kinds of services where we have our greatest strength. And I would just say one thing, if, if in your mind you have this uh, a fear about the Belt and Road, 
it's worth just remembering why did the World Bank, why did the advanced countries end up creating multilateral institutions to do this kind of thing? I think in large measure it's because they learned being a kind of a colonial power and making a bunch of loans does not generate love and if they can't pay back the money now you're sending gunboats down there and saying give us our money back and it, and it's, it does the opposite. So did the Belt and Road Initiative just kind of reinvent the thing that they designed the World Bank and others to, to get away from? I think it's worth thinking through. And I guess uh, I, I'd just like the, the sure. one thing that we've taken off the table is, is trade agreements, which, which we're just not negotiating enough of. They are the best way a country can tie their hands to good policy, just claim that they've signed this trade agreement, that's the way the markets are going to operate, I can't change it. And, and a lot of developing countries benefit from that, knowing that, that they're going to be able to enforce uh, good market conduct. I've got one minute to squeeze in a question that I, I forgot to ask earlier that you can each give yes, no answer to. Although, if you wish, I'll spare you from this one, um, Dambisa. Is Jay Powell the next chairman of the Fed? Yes. Yes, from Doug. It's, it's, I have no inside information. <laughs> you don't have to have inside information. You just have to pick yes or no. <laughs> I agree thoroughly with Austin. Yeah. <laughs> well, on that informative note, <laughs> Thank you all very much. Thank you, Dambisa, and um, uh, enjoy you, the rest of your afternoon. Thank you. thank you, Doug, Austin, Mike, Ed, and Dambisa. Thank you for joining us from London tonight. Great, so um, just one quick housekeeping announcement. Um, some of you were here yesterday when you met our rising leaders. We're gonna have a reception outside um, in the seaport room out there after our last talk today with Secretary Mayorkas. You're most welcome to join us to celebrate. They've been in it for a year, so this is kind of like their graduation. So please come join us to celebrate. Um, now, before uh, we start go into our big long panel, we're going to have a flash talk from Mr. Mike Brown, who is the director of the Defense Innovation Unit. So please welcome Mike to the stage for me. Thank you so much. Well, what if there was a commercial company that uh, was able to give us satellite imagery that you could see almost anywhere in the world you wanted to see down to one third meter resolution and you could see through clouds and you could see at night? It'd be pretty, pretty nifty, wouldn't it be? So in fact, that technology exists today and there are two companies that the Defense Innovation Unit is working with that are producing uh, that technology. And of course, because it's commercial technology, and because commercial technology is available over the internet, uh, that's available to anyone as a service. And would you believe it if I told you that, as a service, even college students were watching the building of Chinese nuclear missile silos. Now, I'm sure the government knew about this at the same time, but it's amazing that you can't hide anymore. So, this was readily available and written up uh, by the media that uh, a student undergraduate at Reed College was among the researchers that was watching this capability. Uh, and if we uh, get the technology to work, we'll actually show you some of these images here in a moment. You probably wouldn't find it too hard to believe that, of course, we're putting up our own, you'll see some of the satellite imagery, we're putting up our own constellations of satellites. This was discussed yesterday in the panel on space infrastructure. So, one company putting as many as 40,000 of these very small satellites up in the air. So China also has this capability, unfortunately, and is powering their own military with this kind of satellite imagery. But you might or might not find it hard to believe that our own military has difficulty fielding this capability so that all our commanders globally can see this kind of imagery which provides tremendous situational awareness no matter where you are in the world. Well, why is that? We'll, we'll talk about that next. I, I would uh, say that this is really a canary in the coal mine because this isn't just about commercial satellite imagery. It's about many aspects of commercial technology. So we could be talking about small drones or 5G or additive manufacturing or digital wearables. There are so many innovations that are happening in our commercial sector that could be very valuable to the military. And we have to find a way to get them to our military, to our warfighters, faster. 
Well, what's the problem? Why, uh, why wouldn't we be able to get that to the military more quickly? That sounds like an easy problem. Well, to answer that question, we've got to go back in time, all the way to 1961. <laughs> 1961 was referred to yesterday by Senator Jack Reed when he talked about something we're going to dig into a little bit, a little wonky, P, P, B, and E. Anyone who's uh, been around the Pentagon knows exactly what I'm talking about. Program, planning, budget, and execution. State of the art when Secretary McNamara brought it from the Ford Motor Company over to the Pentagon in 1961. This was an era where the uh, Defense Department was developing its own technology for the most part, and it didn't need so much commercial technology. That's, that's changed dramatically uh, today, as we know. In fact, eight out of the 10 modernization priorities determined by the Department of Defense are commercial, things we'd all recognize, like AI software or autonomous systems, rapid launch, satellite imagery, all things that we just talked about. So in that era where the Pentagon was a first mover, someone that was inventing the technology and bringing it to, uh, we'd say, to the market or to use first, this system, PPBNE, uh, worked pretty well, uh, you could argue, for many, many years. It's not working for commercial technology. In fact, it's really a roadblock to bringing commercial technology in. And to, to understand why, we have to dig the next layer deeper. And everyone from the Pentagon is going to know what I'm talking about here. PPBNE is really connected to three interlocking processes, requirements, acquisition, and budgeting. These processes are not fast, and they're not agile. <laughs> so what might have worked in 1961, maybe for a couple of decades after that, in a world where we've got to shift or orient ourselves to a competition with China, which I'd argue is a tech race, we have to rethink these uh, fundamentals of the process to speed this commercial technology so it can be in warfighters' hands. Well, let me take just a minute or two and explain for those of you who don't know about how those processes work, and I didn't know when I took this job leading the Defense Innovation Unit how they work. I, I sure as heck know about them now. Just, just how they work. So requirements. This is the process by where the Pentagon does study and decides what we need to build in very uh, detailed fashion. So imagine we want to build the next aircraft carrier. We're going to write requirements of what that carrier needs to have. That takes a very long time. It can take years. In some cases, it takes a decade. A huge frustration of General Hyten. He said recently, why is the answer to every question I ask about follow-on capability 10 to 15 years? Well, 10 years is requirements, spending time doing that. Think how nonsensical that is for the commercial market. We don't need to go through that process and tell these builders of commercial satellites uh, what to build. They've already built it. Let's move on. Once we get requirements, then we go to the acquisition process. Well, now we invoke something called federal acquisition regulations. It's every bit as onerous as it sounds. Uh, Secre uh, Senator Reid yesterday talked about an atoll that was built up layer by layer, and all the sediment uh, all of a sudden gets to a pretty high level. This is similar to federal acquisition regulations as we keep preventing past mistakes by layering on other rules and regulations. In fact, uh, Senator uh, Dan Sullivan of Alaska likes to say, what we need to do is classify the federal acquisition regulations, make it top secret, have the Chinese steal it, and put them behind it at 20 years. <laughs> I think he, he might be onto something there, but I, I think they're smart enough to, to know that's probably not gonna, not gonna work. So what does that really mean, federal acquisition regulations? Well, what it means is we go through a process after we get requirements and say, why don't we think about selecting down to a single vendor, and why don't we ask them to produce whatever it is that the requirements tell us to do, and let's ask them to build that, sometimes at low volume, for 20, 30, or 40 years. Well, how do you think that works out? Vendor lock, right? Think about the F-35 and Lockheed Martin. They're doing exactly what we told them to do in the Pentagon. Vendor lock, development stops the day we buy the first unit. So unlike my Tesla or my iPhone that's being updated while I sleep, the development stops as soon as we buy the first unit. There's no commercial market. There's no platform to continue developing for. We've already said build it to the specifications we told you, the requirements. So the development stops. And then, of course, uh, when you're building something for 20, 30, or 40 years, anyone in the commercial market would look at that and say, oh my god, I don't even know how that's possible, uh, because 
the technology moves so fast. So it ends up being a lot more expensive for the government to keep building that old technology, maybe at low production rates for a very long time. And the result is we have sustainment costs that are two thirds of the total cost of a program. So we, uh, you know, I hear Chairman Adam Smith talk all the time about the cost of an F-35 and how expensive they are per tail. That's not the half of it. It's the sustainment costs that are what we might not be able to afford over the long term. So that's the acquisition process. Fortunately, there is an antidote to the federal acquisition regulations, and it's something called other transaction authority. Congress has already given the Defense Department the ability to do something different. This is what we use at the Defense Innovation Unit, but it's not that widely deployed. Not that many people are trained in it, and I've even heard the philosophy that why would we ever use that if the FAR can do the job? I just explained some of the problems with the FAR. So we need to reorient ourselves for commercial technology to think about using something different. Okay, after we're through with the acquisition process, then we move to budgeting. And this is the part that uh, needs the most help today. That's because, as many of you know, it takes us two and a half years to program a dollar that we're gonna spend in the Defense Department. A year and a half or so to build up that budget by line item through the Defense Department, a year for Congress to approve that budget, and that's if they approve it on time. As we heard from General Milley yesterday, we're in a period now when we don't even know what the appropriation is gonna be. So that also is not a, uh, an agile process. So we have requirements, acquisition, and budgeting. Uh, those are the three things we need to rethink if we're gonna move a lot faster, if we think we're in a tech competition that requires speed and agility. We heard General Nakasone say, speed, agility, you need a force. I couldn't agree with him more. That's the objective. Why don't we change the process so that it gives us that kind of objective? That's the hard work we need to do. Now, fortunately, a lot of the tools are already in place. We're pioneering some of those at Defense Innovation Unit today. So let me give you what I think are the four key elements to what I'll call a fast follower strategy, which is what I think we need to deploy. So think back to 1961. We just talked about first mover. The Pentagon is not in that position anymore. In 1960, Pentagon and defense contractor R&D was one third of the globe's R&D. Okay, we were calling a lot of the shots then. <laughs> Today, that number instead of 33% is 3%. So we have to recognize, obviously much more is happening outside the US, but much more is happening in the commercial sector. Probably a factor of four to five X investment in R&D in the commercial sector we need to be leveraging and innovation that we need to be harnessing from everywhere. So four elements to a fast follower strategy. We call it fast follower because this is what the commercial world does when it's not first to market. You quickly follow to make sure that you minimize that time between the first mover and your being able to deploy that technology. I think it's a very good analogy for where the Defense Department needs to be for these technologies we just talked about where we're not leading. AI, cyber, autonomous systems, additive manufacturing, and so on. So, four elements. The first one, requirements. Good news, we don't need that. So, we just need a simplified version of assessing what the need is and then assessing who are the, who's the vendor set out there. That can replace uh, the writing the detail requirements. Second thing, we need organizational homes for commercial technology. As you all know, the services are pretty decentralized, but the last thing we need to do with the commercial satellite imagery is say, I need an Army version, a Navy version, <laughs> right, Air Force. So today there's really no uh, decided on place for where some of these commercial technologies would be assessed and procured. So that leads to confusion, and in some cases, the splintering of that capability. So if we have an organizational home for these commercial technologies, it doesn't have to be the same home for all of them, uh, then it's gonna be pretty clear who should be assessing and who's responsible for bringing that technology in and getting it deployed, more importantly. The third thing we need is commercial acquisition framework or process. Now we can build on the other transaction authority that I talked about a moment ago. That's not a new capability. Congress gave that to NASA in 1958 after Sputnik. We're just slow to be adopting that, very slow, and making it widespread. But let me tell you how that works. It's pretty simple. What we do at the Defense Innovation Unit when we've got a hard technology problem is we translate that without the military jargon and send that to the commercial market and say, what have you got? We did that recently with a project we call hybrid space architecture, which was trying to take government satellites and these commercial satellites that we were just looking at some of the images from and say, how could we 
have a communication network that's resilient, resilient to cyber attacks, and reduce the latency in that communication. I might have thought maybe we'd have 10 companies respond to that. 130 companies responded. They wanted to uh, uh, play with us at Department of Defense, which in itself is a very good sign. If we can show companies the opportunity, they're all about uh, supporting Department of Defense. And I'm talking to you from you know, where I live in Silicon Valley. So if you've heard a rumor that Silicon Valley doesn't want to work with the Defense Department, that's old news. I just had a uh, meeting with Google. You saw it in the news. Even after Project Maven, they're excited about working with the Defense Department. Bottom line, uh, if you have that many companies, you've got to have a process to go through and winning them down. We do. We minimize uh, their time, their opportunity cost, by saying, don't fill out this special government form. Just send us your normal pitch deck like you'd send another uh, uh, customer or an investor. So we take that, they haven't spent much time, winnow that down to those who will get a prototype contra contract from us. That prototype contract, we focus on speed, how to get them on contract in 60 to 90 days, and do it at commercial terms. No onerous IP requirements. Why should we think we need to own the IP of these companies? So when we do that, we maximize the competition, we minimize the opportunity cost to draw more vendors in, and we get better value for government dollar because we're leveraging all that commercial base and those companies continue to develop their platform. In the case of the images you just looked at, they're owning that hardware that's up in space, they're servicing it. When that, that comes time to retire, that's their responsibility. We don't have to own that in the government. So what a much better value for taxpayers. So uh, those elements, no requirements, organizational home, a commercial framework uh, for buying, and then the last thing, consistent budgeting for capability. What do I mean by that? So rather than thinking about a, a program of record where we're going to buy a specific item, F-35, from one vendor, what we need is a little bit of flexibility from Congress to say, we're gonna budget for an ongoing capability. We're probably gonna need satellite images from now to as long as we're around. So why don't we budget for the capability and leave it up to the Defense Department to decide who's the best vendor, what's the current technology? That way, we can continue to refresh that without going back every time to say this is a new requirement. It's not really a new requirement, it's capability we need on an ongoing basis. But now we're gonna be able to deliver the most current technology at the best available prices. So a much better way to go forward if we could combine those four elements. So let me wrap up. I think the topic of the next panel is about technological advantage. There's no question we need technological advantage to prevail in the strategic competition with China. For the military, that means that we've got to modernize faster, we've got to use more commercial technology, and I think we need a strategy that, if not what I described, is akin to a fast follower strategy. We have to make requirements, acquisition, and budgeting work for the Pentagon again, be enablers instead of big roadblocks that they, they are today. I've been leading DIU for three years now, and what I see is we're not going fast enough. We're not transforming at the scale that we need to, uh, to make changes in to address the threat with China. I think this is part of the solution. I agree completely with what General Nakasone said yesterday. The human capital that we have in our volunteer force is extraordinary. What I've seen firsthand in terms of the capability and dedication to mission is phenomenal, it's impressive. We owe it to those men and women to give them the best tools we ought to have an incredible sense of urgency and impatience and courage to change those 60-year-old processes to give them the best so they have adequate tools to do their job, which is, after all, what's important to all of us, keeping us safe.